Hey, everybody. Welcome to another episode of Purple Insider. Matthew Collar here and joining me from his car in Vancouver after covering a Canucks uh, practice is Farhan Lalji of uh, TSN. Uh, But actually, we're not going to talk puck. We're going to talk some football, Farhan, because you covered Michael Penix this year for Washington. You kind of cross over between CFL guy, NHL guy, and college football, and even maybe a little NFL draft thrown in there. So what's up, man? How are you? Uh, are the Canucks going to make the playoffs? Is that where we should start this conversation? Well, let's not, because I'm hockeyed out. But yeah, they're, they're absolutely going to make the playoffs. They should have clinched a playoff spot the other night, and I'm sure they will. I don't know how far they'll go, but they're definitely going to make it. All right. Well, okay. We'll see. Uh, We're in a little bit of a struggle land here with the Mm. wild um, at the moment, and I don't know how they're going to break out of it, but that's somebody else's podcast, man. So (laughs) let's talk about uh, Michael Penix because you had an opportunity to cover Michael Penix uh, this year and saw him lead the nation in passing. And it's been very interesting to follow him through the draft process because After the game against Texas, you would have thought he had a chance to compete with Caleb Williams at the very top of the draft. Everyone was so high on him. And then after they lose the national championship, which doesn't really seem like a very sound way to do this, but his draft stock in the mock draft universe seemed to fall off the face of the earth after that. So you having a chance to cover him up close and personal, where should his draft stock actually land? Now, listen, I'm going to be transparent here because... Uh, when it comes to Michael Penix, I'm half fan, half reporter, right? So uh, for the last 40 years, I've, you know, I've, I've watched the, the University of Washington football program closely, right? I, I live here in the area, and, um, and, and I've certainly been a fan of that program. And I generally never have to cross with, you know, fandom and journalism because the Huskies aren't in the college football playoff, right? So I, I get to kind of watch them one way. Um, so I'm a little biased when it comes to Michael Penix, but also understand that I have watched every snap, every pass he's made as a Washington Husky and dissected it closely for the last couple of years beyond what he just did in the college football playoffs. So um, I think this guy's absolutely an NFL quarterback. I struggle with some of the criticisms of him and some are really valid, but, but you are right because even though he was a runner up for the Heisman trophy and he's led the nation in passing the last two seasons, um, it really is amazing to see how the pendulum swung once he entered the national consciousness to everybody, not just Heisman voters, but everybody in those two college football playoff games. Because the one thing with Michael is he's had those injuries that he had at Indiana. And you you can't run from those injuries. They are there and they're part of his story. He's been incredibly healthy the last couple of seasons. Part of that has been because the offensive line has been so good they managed to protect him. Um, So one of the real criticisms of Michael Penix is what happens when he's got a playoff platform? And Against Texas, he had to do that because that defense was so good. Their interior guys drew double teams, and that allowed some extra guys to come. And he was able to move, and he was able to slide up in the pocket, play off platform, make really good throws in that game. And he actually had three designed runs, which they hadn't done in two years because they were trying to get him healthy or keep him healthy. And now all of a sudden, it's the college football playoffs and the gloves are off, right? So he showed an ability to do that against a very good Texas team, and that really elevated him, as you say, And then against Michigan, against a really good team, he struggled, right? Uh, You know, he missed throws in the first half. Then he got banged up early in the third quarter on that interception, and it affected him even more. And it wasn't necessarily the best final memory to leave people with. But I think when you look at his body of work, um, the way he's been able to throw the ball in every spot on the field accurately, um, the leadership abilities that he possesses and all of it, I find it difficult to quibble with this guy as a draft pick, a high draft pick. Now, is he going to go in the top 10? Heck no. Uh, But, you know, he could go late in the first round. And and if not, you know, I don't think he gets much past the middle of the second round because I think there's going to be a lot of teams in the second round, including maybe Minnesota, that view him as a real steal. Well, the, your appreciation for Michael Penix is why I asked you to come on because I know yeah. how closely you've watched that program uh, for so long and had a chance to you know go out there and cover games and things like that for him. So you've gotten to get a really close and detailed look. And that's what I want to ask you about a little bit more is some of those critiques of his because he was a playmaker more at Indiana And how much should we look at the offense designed to make sure that he didn't get injured again, because Washington is not making the national championship. If Michael Penix was hurt uh, versus what he can or cannot do in the NFL. And there's a stat. I also want to ask you about 
his ability to avoid sacks this year was downright incredible. He is the best uh, of any guy coming out this year, him and Bo Nix, uh, at avoiding those sacks. Do you, do you look at that as something that can translate over to the NFL, despite the fact that he's never going to be on the level of, say, Jaden Daniels or Caleb Williams when it comes to a runner? Yeah, I think it can, and for two reasons. One of them is he's got an incredibly quick release. So people look at him and they're like, oh, he's got a weird release. I think that's because people aren't used to looking at him left-handed. But if you look at him, he can get from drop to base to ball out instantly. And when a blitz comes, he can get it out instantly. He doesn't need a lot of room in front of him to step into throws. He's got breathtaking arm talent, right? And so, you know, he can be very sudden with how he gets the ball out. He doesn't need to ease it out or have a big looping long delivery or have to double hitch into a lot of throws. The second thing is, you know, what does it mean that they kept him protected? Boy, every sure, every coach I know would sure love to keep the quarterback protected a lot. And, it, it you know, it's simply not that easy. One of the reasons he's able to keep himself protected is he's got a tremendous understanding of the offense and is able to get into the right protections. So I think, you know, he really had to morph as a quarterback from his time at Indiana to his time at Washington because he was more of a dual threat player coming out of high school early in his career at Indiana. He couldn't sustain it that way. Two knee injuries, two shoulder injuries. He had to change and he was able to change. And obviously, you know, good personnel in front of him, really good coaching around him and really good talent, um, you know, at the receiver positions all contributed to that because there were certainly moments where somebody was coming and he was able to get it out quick and just put his receiver in a position to win a jump ball. And those receivers more often than not just won so many contested balls. And that's also been a criticism of Michael Penix that you've got three NFL receivers. All of them are going to go in the first two days of the draft, but this isn't Mac Jones. Right. Like this guy has got far more arm talent because I remember that being a criticism of Jones that he's playing with all these great players. When you look at the amount of downfield passing that Penix was asked to do at Washington, you know, it, it's not easy to protect yourself in those scenarios. And he was able to do it. And I, I do think that translates. The, the arm talent is very special. And when you watched him even throw at the combine, I mean, just look at the way the ball comes out of his hand. It might yeah. be because his hands are bigger than most wide receivers, most tight ends. Yeah. He has uh, people here would know how big Kyle Rudolph, Kyle Rudolph's hands were so big. They had the, like the hamburger helper thing. They, somebody gave him a stuffed animal, the hamburger helper in his uh, locker. Yeah. That's like the same size as Michael Penix. And I think that that really helps him as far as being able to spin it. Uh, but, uh, you know, when he comes to throwing to good wide receivers, if he were to become a Minnesota Viking, let me think, uh, they got some pretty good wide receivers. So that's yeah. a weird criticism. Uh, but also that came up with Joe Burrow as well when he was throwing to Jefferson and throwing to Jamar Chase. Like, well, that's actually, you know, not necessarily proof that someone won't become good in the NFL. The thing that makes him stand out to me is his ability to lead receivers. And I think this is the talent that is most necessary to push the ball down the field in the NFL. And I don't mean 40, 50 yards. I mean, intermediate 10 to 20 yards, but there has to be anticipation there. And I just saw with his throwing ability, he did not have to see his guy open. He could throw it to a spot for that guy to get open. And the right-handed comparison I would make a little bit with that is like a Geno Smith where he's got the big yep. arm and he can lead guys. And you know, Geno's not that much of a runner either. I, I think there might be, well, I mean, you're out in that area. There might mm -hmm. be some somewhat, somewhat of a comparison there between those two quarterbacks in the just pure arm talent and the way that they throw the football. Yeah, I think that's fair. You know, I like I do think his ceiling is 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 higher than Geno's, right? But some of those particular traits, I think, make sense because even Geno Smith, when he was coming out of high school and when he was at West Virginia, was a much more dynamic runner, right? And things changed for him as he got into the NFL and he had to slow the game down. And that required not just taking off as quickly as he did earlier in his career and does get the ball out of his hands pretty quickly. Um, you know, I, I think, you know, one of Geno's problems right now is he, is he, even though he's got a quick release, he double clutches so often. And that winds up getting him into trouble. And you just don't see that with Penix. So he leads receivers particularly well. You know, the one thing he needs to do more of, which this offense didn't ask, was deeper throws in the middle of the field, right? Outside the hash marks, there was a lot of that. Middle of the field on closer routes within 15 to 20 yards, there was a lot of that. But usually, if he was throwing deep down the middle of the field, it was a deep crosser 
with a touch pass that allowed him to take the ball into the far zone, right? Like the, the neck zone over that even though the receiver is running between the hash marks, the reception might have happened outside a hash mark against man coverage. So, you know, there are some of those things. Can he split safeties, NFL safeties between the hash marks at 20 yards, you know, on a hard post with a low trajectory, you know, where he's such a high trajectory thrower. So there's some of those things that, you know, are fair criticisms and, and that you want to see. It's not to say he can't do them. It's just that he wasn't necessarily asked to do them. Um, you know, and in terms of off platform, this guy's not going to be Lamar Jackson, right? He's not going to be that guy that's going to make guys miss, but can he navigate the pocket slide and just get out long enough to get the ball out of his ends? I think he can do that. And, you know, you mentioned Joe Burrow. Here's the other criticism. Michael Penix is too old. Guess what? Same age as Joe Burrow when he came into the NFL, right? Because you've had a long collegiate career. And that's not an indictment, especially now. Like, look at the 2021 and 2022 draft classes. Everybody is missed. I don't think any of those teams care how old those guys are. You, you know what I mean? Like, they're just not good enough to play. If you can get a guy to a second contract as a quarterback in the NFL, like, you have done something right as a scouting department. And, you know, for Michael Penix, that will happen when he's 28, which still doesn't make you too old because quarterbacks are playing even longer. So, um, you know, that's the other piece of it, along with where the locations of those throws are that you talked about. And I, I think what you bring up is a serious challenge for the Minnesota Vikings because their options are, you know, maybe trade everything up for Drake may trade yeah. enough to try to get JJ McCarthy or potentially sit at 11 and take Michael Penix or Bo Nix or, take another player and then try to wait and see who hangs around. I think that there's somebody who's going to like Michael Penix in the first round. I could be completely wrong. The mock drafters have him all over the place. His, uh, his, his actual status is really hard to pin down. It is for a lot of guys anyway, but I think for him in particular, you could definitely see one team uh, buying in. By the way, my old school comp for him is Drew Bledsoe. If he doesn't move yep. at all in the NFL, just the guy who's going to stand in the pocket and just fire away. But remember Bledsoe had that lower release a little bit. Yeah. He was taller, but it was the same kind of like, you know, lower release. I th Phil Rivers had that too, but I don't think he had the velocity of uh, Michael Penix. So we've seen other quarterbacks who throw like that uh, have a lot of success. Uh, before I ask you your opinion on his draft stock, uh, about his leadership and what he's gone through to be at this point, this is probably my biggest selling point on Michael Penix, aside from the cannon, is just when you cover an NFL team every day, you see how much these guys go through. And this is my deepest respect for Kirk Cousins, is the amount of times where he's criticized like crazy, the injuries that you go through and have to fight through to get back on the field, the, the you know, it's not always the best coaching. It's, you know, whatever it is, you know, there's so much pressure, so much adversity, and you lose a lot of football games and you have to keep fighting. And what Michael Penix had to do to get to that national championship game is, and this is not a downside on JJ McCarthy. It's just that I can prove it with Michael Penix that he could keep fighting where McCarthy's kind of had everything just fall in line with him at Michigan. But Penix's ability to battle through all of those injuries and take a team that, as you mentioned, never goes to that stage, I think is incredibly impressive from a, from a character standpoint. Yeah, no, I think the leadership is, is huge and it's translated really well because when he came in here, uh, when he came to Washington his first year, I think a lot of fans were hoping a quarterback named Sam Heward was going to win that battle. So they had Dylan Morris, who was their starting quarterback the previous two years and then, and um, wasn't great. And Sam Heward was a legacy kid, right? Uh, Damon Heward's son, Brock Heward's nephew. And, you know, certainly a big part of the fan base was hoping that he'd win the battle. Very early on, we knew it was going to go to Penix, but the way he took that team over that had been a bit scarred from the previous year and the previous regime uh, under Jimmy Lake, for him to walk in there and just instantly earn everybody's respect. And when you talk to people in that building, it wasn't just the players, it was the support staff and everybody else who he treated with a lot of respect and, and humility. Um, I, I think that's a big, big selling point for Michael Penix is that just the adversity that he's battled, but just the, the overall character that he has. I mean, Kevin O'Connell is going to love coaching this guy if he gets that opportunity um, because, uh, you know, you can criticize, uh, the, you know, the footwork, the age, the injury, but that character element, I don't think you can criticize at all in Michael Penix Jr. I think he hits a home run. And when you look at potential teams, I know Minnesota is, is in a good spot to potentially take a guy like that. I think Seattle might be a team that, has some interest. I look at Atlanta, uh, where, where Cousins just wound up as the next guy. 
And, you know, I think a team's not going to want to take him with their first pick because the teams that are going to want to take him are going to have a guy in the building that's established and that team's going to have needs because they're going to think they can get over the hump this year. But you look at Minnesota, who's now got two picks in the first round. Can you get him with your second pick and still address some needs with the first pick? Um, you know, I think those are the teams that are that are probably going to fit best. If Seattle trades down because they've got other needs, could they take him with their second pick? So there's there's a few of those places where where it fits. But if you value character, he's right there. And, and I'm not down on J.J. McCarthy, but it seems very quickly, like I thought it was going to be a great spot for Minnesota. This guy's ascending up the draft board so fast. I think we're going to have quarterbacks with the top four picks. Somebody's going to trade. Arizona's going to trade and pass on Marvin Harrison Jr., so that somebody can take J.J. McCarthy, right? And, you know, for Bo Nix and Michael Penix, does that bring them up a little bit later in the first round? It wouldn't shock me. There's such a desperate need in this league at the position. And as a result, guys get overvalued. Michael Penix seems to me an overthink it prospect where, like, don't don't get lost in the woods and overthink it. Watch yeah. him play, right? Like, watch him throw yeah. the football. And also, what I really like, too, about him, and uh, you could tell I've been sort of banging the Penix drum, that if the Vikings are in a position where they can't get that top four, I just see such a fit with Kevin O'Connell. As you mentioned, the way that they played offense, he was operating a lot at the line of scrimmage for college. Yeah. Like, no one's doing a lot in college in comparison to the NFL. But a lot of motions. It looked like there was a good amount of reads going on. And he really just had this, like, I'm in total command. This is my team completely. And with McCarthy now, maybe two, three years from now, if he kept playing college football, he'd look exactly the same. That's the challenge of comparing them as prospects. Right. But I thought that Penix, the way he was out of the shotgun, which I know is where Kevin O'Connell wants his quarterback and just running everything at the line of scrimmage, he's going to want a quarterback who can do the same thing. So as he goes to these meetings, I think that's the thing that Penix and him have to really connect well on for that to, to come to fruition, because we could see a scenario where the Vikings are not the team that gets to number four. Maybe it's the Giants because they have a shorter way to go, and they have to look at Knicks and Penix, which is what I wanted to ask you is, Knicks versus Penix, what's your feeling on that? Well, different types of players, right? And both similar in the fact that they've played a lot of college football. They've been through a lot of battles. As the last three years have kind of evolved, both men have gained a, a tremendous amount of respect for one another, and they built a friendship there. You saw that at the end of the Pac-12 title game, uh, not just on the field, but in the press conference after, that they stuck around to hear what the other guy had to say and spend some time. But uh, certainly Bo Nix can, can use his legs a lot better than Michael Penix can. I think, I think that's the big thing, and he doesn't have the injury history. But – you know, I think there's a lot of similarities there. I don't think that Bo makes as many down the field throws, right? Because the offense at Oregon was so much more of a quick out college screen game type of offense. Certainly he hit Troy Franklin down the field a lot. He does have the arm talent, but he wasn't asked to make every throw in every section of the field like you saw more from Michael Penix. Again, not to say that he can't do it. He just hasn't shown a lot of multiple reads in what he's asked to do in Oregon's offense. Whereas, like I said, you know, you, you talked about what Kevin O'Connell likes in terms of operating at the line of scrimmage, the amount of shifts and motions that Washington does, nobody else does in college football. Mm -hmm. You know, they had a number of players that could be versatile and play a number of different areas. They had a, a guy named Jack Westover, who was a tight end H back fullback, and you can move him around with a lot of the shifts and motions. And they took full advantage of that. So talking to Ryan Grubb, I remember at one point, he says, people think that I'm always in his ear telling him when all these shifts and things need to occur. And, and that didn't happen, right? So whether it was getting in and out of protections or, you know, running the play as executed and then making decisions to change, uh, he's been asked to do that and done it at a very high level. Bo Nix, maybe he can, but he hasn't been asked to do it because they just operate at a different kind of speed at Oregon where he was asked to just get to the line quick and get the ball out quick. And I think both players are very good prospects that if the Vikings end up yep. with them, you could see why they would fit. I just look at the downfield passing, the sort of commanding that offense, the way the Penix did as being maybe a better fit with Kevin O'Connell, if they end up getting there. So before I let you go, uh, I want to know, cause I know you love the draft. 
I yeah. want to know your I want to know your hottest quarterback take right now. I mean, you can always adjust this as we go forward uh, and so forth. But what is it right now that you feel like, you know, you think something, but you don't feel like the draft industrial complex as my friend Aaron Nagler calls it. Like you don't feel like the outside world is giving enough credit or enough criticism or whatever. Give me give me something hot here to close the show. I'm not feeling Drake May at all. Uh, like I get that he's got the right body. I get that he looks the part. Um, I am not feeling Drake May at all. And if he goes to the Patriots at number three with how bad that offense is and how bad those weapons are, it's going to be a, 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 a – he'll be the next guy that's quick in and out because he makes questionable decisions. He's lost a lot of football games. I am not feeling Drake May. I get the ceiling. Like Caleb Williams I think is can't miss. I get the ceiling with Jaden Daniels. Um, and, and quite frankly, I, I like J.J. McCarthy a lot. Um, but uh, I am not feeling Drake May one bit. Wow, we're on opposite ends of the spectrum here with Drake May. And this is this is why okay. the draft's so great, right? You know ball. Hey, look, I, I thought Johnny ball. Manziel was gonna I thought Johnny Manziel was gonna be good, right? So I don't have it all right. Oh, I thought Josh Rosen was going to be the best quarterback in that draft. Uh, and it turned out to be that uh, was not correct. In fact, there are two future Hall of Famers in that draft. But and here, I thought here, he was better than them. <laughs> here's why this is art, not science. Okay. Um, I remember the Carson Wentz, Jared Goff draft like it was yesterday. And coming out of the college football season, neither player was ranked in the top 10 on anybody's board. But you go through the offseason, you go through the combine, you go through the underwear Olympics and teams are desperate. Who of these quarterbacks is going to look bad on a pro day? Michael Penix is going to have his pro day tomorrow. Who's going to look bad at a pro day? And by the time you get to the draft, not only were those two guys taken one and two, teams gave up a king's ransom to take them at one and two. There's such a desperate need at the position. Guys get overvalued. It's going to happen here. The trivia question you're asking for is Teddy Bridgewater. The only guy I can ever remember coming out of his pro day that actually got criticized for it. Cause I think he didn't <laughs> wear his gloves or something was the, uh, if you remember that whole thing. Yeah. Uh, yeah. But, it's coming back to me. Hey, the Drake may conversation is really interesting because I look at the pure arm talent and what yep. they could put around him. I also look at how bad his team was. I thought his team was, I mean, when I look at Penix, great receivers, great offensive design. And with Drake May, it was kind of, hey, throw it deep or run for him. And so it's a lot about what I think he can become, the size, the arm talent. But if you just watched him play last year, you might go, I don't know about that. Kind of actually reminds me of Jordan Love a little bit when I watched him at Utah State. And I was like, yeah, I'm not sure I really see it. But then after a couple of years, then the tools come together. I think his tools are probably the best of anyone that's not Caleb Williams. Uh, you, you could be right. You could be right. And look, uh, you know, I always respect teams that draft for ceiling and not floor, right? If you draft for high floor, you're going to get Kenny Pickett and Mac Jones. Take a swing, draft for ceiling, and he's got that. We'll see if he ever, uh, if he ever finds it. And if he does, save this receipt and come back to me in three years and uh, I'll, I'll come back on and you can dunk on me. Hey, this is uh, the thing that makes it so much fun to talk to everybody is all the different perspectives. So I love yeah. that you are going an opposite way of me looking at Drake May. Uh, Farhan Lalji uh, on Twitter, add a TSN at the end and you'll find you. I really enjoy following you, man. I love the CFL updates. I keep an eye on the Canucks because of you. You do it all out there. And uh, I really appreciate you taking the time to pop on and um, congratulations to your team, the Huskies on a great season, even if it uh, didn't work out quite at the end. <laughs> yeah, it was, a, it was a weird 72 hours after all of that. Uh, hopefully I never have to watch anything like that again. Thanks for having me, bud. <laughs> yep, thanks for having me, man. And uh, we'll catch you all next time on Purple Insider. Let's do it.